Good evening. We're going to begin our Bible study. Um, it'll be coming from 1 Samuel chapter number 2. And we'll begin at verse number 12. Um, I already prayed uh, before this viewing, asking God to give us enlightenment in the scriptures as we read them. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 12, I begin to read probably down to verse number 26. I'll be reading out of the Amplified Bible, which is now referred to as the Amplified Classic. Um, we're going to start with verse number 12. It says, the sons of Eli were base and worthless. They did not know or regard the Lord. And the custom of the priests with the people was this. When any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servants came while the flesh was bawling in a flesh hook of three prongs in his hand. And he thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in shallow with all the Israelites who came. Verse 15. Also, before they burned the fat, this is important. Before they burned the fat, the priest servants came and said to the man who sacrificed, Give the priest meat to roast, for he will not accept bald meat from you, but raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first, and then you may take as much as you want, the priest servant would say, no, give it to me now, or I will take it by force. So the sin of the two young men was very great before the Lord, for they despised the offering of the Lord. Verse 18, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little robe and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord give you children by this woman for the gift she asked for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. Verse 21, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she bore three sons and two daughters, and the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Verse 22, now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons did to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the door of the tent of meetings. And he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is no Good report, which I hear the Lord's people spreading abroad. If one man wrongs another, God will mediate for him. But if a man wrongs the Lord, who shall intercede for him? Yet they did not listen to their father, for it was the Lord's will to slay them. Verse 26. Now the boy Samuel grew and was in favor both with the Lord and with men. A man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus said the Lord, excuse me, thus has the Lord said, I plainly revealed myself to the house of your father, your forefather Aaron. And we know Aaron to be the first high priest uh, in Israel. When they were in Egypt in the bondage of Pharaoh's house. Moreover, I selected him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest to offer on my altar. To burn incense and to wear an ephod before me. And I gave from then on to the house of your father, forefather, all the offerings of Israel made by fire. Why then do you kick, trample upon, treat with contempt my sacrifice and my offering, which I commanded and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves upon the choicest part of every offering of my people Israel? Verse 30. Therefore, the God of Israel says, I excuse me. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel says, I did promise that your house and that your father, forefather Aaron, should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord says, be it far from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And there are a few other verses uh, behind that where God went on and let Eli know that there was going to be some judgment, a uh, punishment for what his sons did and what he allowed. If you were to look early in the book of Samuel, uh, you see that all three of these men, the two sons and Eli, they were priests. 
Uh, this is during the period of the judges. OK, kind of close to the point where Israel is going to demand a king. But they were in that stage where there were no open visions. The Bible said the word of God was rare. God wasn't speaking a lot. There wasn't great revelation coming from God. And I think we can see one of the reasons why that is the case because of the leadership that was in place here uh, in the house. And when I say the house, um, um, you know, they probably had a tabernacle, a temple had not been built yet, but it's representing the, the, the tabernacle, the place where God's presence would be. If you study the Ark of the Covenant, you know that the Ark of the Covenant was a um, piece of furniture, if you will, that was made out of acacia wood and overladen with gold. And on top of that uh, particular furniture, it was a lid that was one solid piece uh, that had two cherubims facing each other. And God would speak through that space to Moses and also to the high priest, uh, the high priest once a year. But God also would speak to his prophets. And that's how God designed it until Israel demanded a king. But we're not that far in the story yet. You see what's happening here and why God is upset. As I was looking at this, and I'm not big on titles of, of messages, but um, since there have been a number of people who have encouraged me to start putting some of these teachings on uh, YouTube or where people can see them because they've been blessed by it. Uh, whatever God gift God has given to me that can bless the people of God, I'm grateful for that. Um, it's not mine, it's his. And, and I want to make it available to the people of God if it can indeed bless them. Uh, I guess if I was to give a topic, I'm not big on topics, I would say uh, if God was speaking to his people through this particular scripture is I want my house back. I want my house back. Um, in the book of Judges, you will find that God raised up different ones like Samson. He raised up uh, Gideon. He raised up different ones at different times. And as soon as God raised them up and delivered them from the Philistines, um, they would go back into sin. And I dealt with this a little bit earlier in the earlier message that we put on YouTube uh, entitled The Danger of Not Knowing God, how a generation rose up that didn't know God. Um, it's so important that the current generation prepare the next generation to understand who God is, uh, not only so far as the benefit, how God could take care of them, but God always required obedience. Uh, when there was not obedience and there was this open rebellion, what the nation of Israel could expect and any nation um, that God hand is on is that there would be judgment. There will be punishments and things that would happen because of walking away from God or disobeying him. So we at this period now where Eli is a priest and you find this over in first Samuel where the Bible does refer to him as a priest over in first Samuel one and nine. And the Bible also referred to his sons as priests. Eli being older, um, he was responsible for making sure that his sons do things right. Uh, he was responsible for making sure that they did right by the people. As a priest, one of the jobs of a priest, and, and if you look back in Deuteronomy where Moses separated the tribe of Levi, uh, Levi meaning in the Hebrew to attach to. The Levites were the ones who uh, came from the lineage of, of, of uh, um all the high priests came, of course, from Aaron, but they came from the tribe of Levi. And all of them were not high priests, uh, but they worked in the temple. They were the tribe set aside to work in the temple. And God has said to Levi that you will not have your own land. All the other tribes had land given to them so far as an inheritance. They, they had, uh, I, I just won't say land, but they didn't have an inheritance. God left it up to the other tribes to uh, uh, take care of them and to... Uh, give, you know, from the tithe and things of that nature, which was the food and the grapes and the olives to make sure that the tribe of Levi always had because their job was to work for God and serve God in the temple. Now, Levi, or should I say Eli, knew what his sons were doing. And when you look at it, uh, I want to go to so we can make sure that we understand what was the requirement. I believe it's in Leviticus chapter number seven. If you go there. Uh, right quick, Leviticus chapter number seven. And I believe we want to look at verse number uh, 
29. Yeah, so start at verse 29. This is uh, Leviticus chapter number 7, verse number 29. I'm reading again out of the Amplified Version, the classic version. And it reads, tell the Israelites, he who offers the sacrifice of his peace offerings to the Lord shall bring his offering to the Lord from the sacrifice of his peace offerings. He shall bring with his own hands the offering made by fire to the Lord. He shall bring the fat with the breast, and that breast may be waved as a wave offering before the Lord. And the priest shall burn the fat. You, you, you hear that part? The priest shall burn the fat. All right. This was God's directive, I believe, through Moses to the people and specifically to the priest. Said the priest, uh, again in verse 31, shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be for Aaron and his sons. Okay. And the right thigh you shall give to the priest for an offering from the sacrifices of your peace offering. And the son of Aaron who offers the blood of the peace offering and the fat shall have the right thigh for his portion. For I have taken the breast that was waved and the thigh that was offered from Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them to Aaron, the priest, and for his sons as a perpetual, excuse me, as their perpetual due from Israel, from the Israelites. All right. So what we see here is that God wanted them to burn the fat. The fat needed to be burned. All right. And then he said what portions could go to the priests are these sons of Levi that was serving as priests. Now, if we go back to our our scripture uh, in verse number 12. It says the sons of Eli were base and worthless. Now, these are men who are standing in the office of a priest. And the job of the priest was to stand before the Lord to minister unto him. All right. They stand before the Lord and they minister to the Lord. All right. Then. They were to turn and bless the people. So they were like a representative uh, of God to the people. And so they had to spend time standing before God, worshiping him and receiving his, his mandates and what he desired. And then they would turn around and give instruction to the people. But these men and sons of Eli were base and worthless. They did not, and this is interesting, did not know or regard the Lord. But their position is very important. Their position is to be an example and to serve God, to serve God, uh, be a servant of God to the people on God's behalf. And God required them to do it a certain way. But the scripture said that they did not know or regard the Lord. That's a dangerous situation when somebody was, is in leadership, uh, may even have leadership credentials, but they are not regarding God. As I said in the earlier message, uh, it's a the danger of not knowing God. I'm talking in general all, about all the people of Israel, but certainly those who will stand in, in, in God's stead, if you will, as a representative, a human being that the people can see, that the people can actually talk to, uh, just like we are today. Uh, must, much, much of what God wants to show and demonstrate is going to be seen through his disciples. But amongst those disciples are those that God has given specific abilities, abilities to build the people of God. Um, and so here we find that these boys were not doing it according to God's will. The Bible says in verse 13, the custom of the priest with the people was this. When any man offered a sacrifice, as was alluded to in Leviticus chapter 7, when the people bring their sacrifice, the Bible, it says here the priest servant came with the flesh with while the flesh was bawling with a flesh hook of three prongs. Remember, they had to burn the fat. But he would come while it was bawling. He would thrust it into the pan. And not just to get the, uh, the wave offering, the breast, or the, the thigh. Whatever came up, that's what they took. Look at verse 15. Also, before they burnt the fat, before they burnt the fat. Before they burnt the fat. Now, Eli's job was to train these his sons on what God's standard was, because this is God's house. Uh, this is his tabernacle. This is the things he's given Moses and set in, 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 in place with specific details. Everything that was made, everything that was in the temple had a purpose for being there. 
because it was God's place, the place where he would meet with uh, those men. And, and, and when the people of Israel bring their sacrifices. Now, we know we don't have to do that today. We don't bring uh, turtle doves and we don't bring bulls and goats. Uh, Paul says we present our bodies a living sacrifice. But at this time, Jesus had not come and died yet and become that ultimate sacrifice. So they had to go in and bring these different offerings. But God required them to do it a specific way. But watch the arrogance in these leaders, in these two men who are supposed to be representing God to the people. It says, before they burned the fat, in verse 15, the priest servant came and said to the man who was offering the sacrifice, give the priest meat to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but raw. That wasn't God's standard. You don't get raw the raw meat. God wanted the fat to burn, and then he was specific in what they could have. So the sin, the sin, what do you mean sin? Missing the mark. It's like you taking some darts and and you have this. Uh, if you've ever played darts, you have uh, a bullseye. And then you have these different ranges around it where if you throw the dart, uh, you can see how close you can get to the bullseye. Well, God's word is and his intent, his design is the bullseye to meet his heart, what he desires. And when we throw the dart, our aim is to hit the bullseye. All right. They weren't even trying to hit the bullseye. They were missing the mark. OK, sinning, sin to miss the mark. It's one thing to miss the mark. Maybe because you didn't pray that morning or whatever, and your boss said something to you. And, 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 and before you really got control of yourself, you responded in a way that was not Christ like. And then you re then you go back and you think about it. and You said, God, that did not represent Jesus Christ. So I'm going back to my boss and said to him the right way and let him know that I shouldn't have responded that way. See, that that maybe wasn't your intention to miss the mark. But here is a deliberate, deliberate, willful sinning. On a regular basis. So the Bible says in verse 17. So the sin of the two young men was very great before the Lord. Not just sin. It was great. And not just great. It was very great. Because they were missing the mark continuously. Instead of going by God's command for his house. They were making up their own rules which seemed to benefit them because they got more from the offering than what God had designed for them to get. And if you ask me, if we keep reading, you'll see that there was some level uh, uh, of arrogance there. And I believe that arrogance comes from the pride of life. I believe there are three things, three roots, whichever sin comes from. And it's either, uh, as I see it, John told the church not to love the world, to love God and not love the world. And he explained that there are three things that's in the world uh, he said that there's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Uh, and if these things are in you, you know, I mean, you don't have the love of the Father. You can't, you can't do it both ways. And so this particular sin of arrogance was uh, a pride of life. You know, hey, we're the preach. You know, y'all, y'all bring the sacrifices, but we run the house. Uh, and also there was the lust of lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh there because they wanted more than what they should have gotten. All right, let's get back to the scriptures here. It says. The sin of the two young men was very great before the Lord, for they despised the offering of the Lord. They despised it. Now, let's go down and see what else they were doing. Verse number 22 says, now, Eli was very old and he heard. So he was aware all that his sons did to all Israel. Because they were serving all Israel and how they listen to this, beloved, lay with the women, lay with them. Now look at this in the Amplified. Then I also looked at it over here in the King James. I have a parallel Bible. And both of them say, King James said, how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Amplified said, how they lay with the women who served at the door of the tent meeting. Lay with them. This is what my understanding, looking at this, uh, as I view it, deals with intercourse, to lay with them. So not only are they taking more than they're supposed to take, not only are they despising the Lord's offering and greatly sinning there, Eli was aware that they were sleeping or laying with the women who came to serve at the temple. Uh, again, this is not their house. They can't do what they want to do. 
It's God's house. He paid the price. He delivered them from Israel. He delivered, um, excuse me, he did, delivered Israel from Egypt. He's the one that provided water in the desert and manna the time that they were in the desert and kept their clothes from getting worn. He was the one that delivered them out of bondage. Now, all he's asking them to do is obey them. But here, the leaders are deciding that they're going to do what they want. Now, they may get away with it for a while. Uh, God is long-suffering, but he's not, he does not have amnesia. He knows what belongs to him. The Bible says, I believe in the Psalms 100, says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with sing. But also in there says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We have to realize that he created us and therefore we uh, should give to him the honor that's due him. So Eli was aware of it. The Bible says in verse 23, and he said unto them, why do you do such things? So Eli addressed them, but he didn't stop them. See, you can be aware and maybe you say something, but him being over his sons, he had the power uh, uh, to get them out of position, uh, not to allow them to continue ministering to the people. Because what does that say to the people? That says that you go along with it. Now, I've been in church a lot in my life. I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ when I was about 17 years old. That's been over 30 years ago. Uh, and a few months after that, uh, I was called into the gospel ministry. And I feared God. I wanted to do what he wanted me to do. And I had an excitement for God. And, you know, I was excited when preachers would come in and I was a young Baptist boy and I got excited about the, you know, uh, when revivals would take place and all of that and groups would come in and sing about Jesus Christ, the quartets and all of that. Then after church, I would see them go out. These guys had just uh, sung about Jesus Christ and they were outside trying to see, make a date. They were outside doing things that didn't represent what they were doing inside the house. And I was like, God, you know, I love the music, but this is bothering me. And then in my years and experience with Christ and, and, and serving in different parts of ministries, I found there to be a carelessness when it comes to following the things that God has said. I've watched the body of Christ where the Bible gives us a gift, a free gift, like what I'm doing right now. I, I'm a teacher and a pastor. That's the gift that I know God has given me. Uh, and that is to watch something go from a seed. Uh, to a fruit bearing tree to watch God's people go from receiving the gospel to now actually being people that are working out the message of Jesus Christ and they can stand now with courage and be a representative of Christ. And, and, and so, you know, to be honest with you, I, let me actually, I want to read that and you probably read it before. Go with me to Ephesians chapter number four. I want to do this as the Spirit of God is leaving, leading me. Um, first, let's do this to establish the house concept. All right? To establish the house concept, I want you to go with me to 1 Peter instead of going to Ephesians. And let me get there and then I invite you to join me. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Look at verse number 4. Because now we're dealing with the Old Testament, and we know in the Old Testament that they were not under grace. They were under the law. Uh, many times, though, when people talk about grace, they look at grace as a covering to sin. And th that's not what grace is there for. Grace is there to empower you to accomplish something that you can't do by yourself. Okay? And, 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 and it's also favor that's given to you. Okay? Not that you earn the favor, but it is given to you uh, because God desires. Okay? So... Grace is not a covering to sin. Grace is God's ability, his favor, but also his ability to empower us to accomplish whatever it is that we are called to do. Look at verse 4 of 1 Peter 2 and 4. It says, uh, read it out of the Amplified again, the classic version. Come to him, then to that living stone, capital letters referring to Christ, which men tried and threw away. They didn't want to keep it. You remember the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they, they didn't like Jesus. OK, uh, after trying him or watching him and listening to him, you know, they threw him. They threw him aside, had him crucified. But which is chosen and precious in God's sight, just because they threw him away. Don't mean that he wasn't precious in God's sight. Now, remember that these Israelites that are doing this. 
This is, if you will, a type of the church. These are, they represent God's people, Israelites, but they threw away the most important stone that is supposed, that is supposed to be positioned in God's uh, house. Now, I want to deal with this concept of house because the title here, I said, I want my house back. And, and back there, you know, this tabernacle that they had, you know, representing the house of God. But look who represents the house of God now. The Bible says, come, verse 5, and like living stones, be yourselves. Now, who's he talking to? Who's Peter talking to? And Peter's talking to the saints of God. He's talking to believers. Be yourselves built into a spiritual house. We are a spiritual house. Now, I know when a lot of people think about the church, they think about a location, 101 Peach Tree Boulevard or whatnot. Uh, uh, when they think of the church, they think about the name of a nonprofit organization, uh, Bright Star Church on the Hill. Uh, that concept is more of a Western concept. Uh, when God looks at the church, he looks at lively stones, born again believers, individuals who connect together and bond together by the spirit of peace uh, into a house, if you will. He says, like living stones, be yourself built into a spiritual house, spiritual house. It's not natural. It's not our flesh that we that we now have to cut. It's, it's not that we have to apply blood like the priest did of that day to their different parts of their body and they had to wash their body and wear certain garments because, you know, they use that physical representation. Those things was a shadow of what was going to come. We are a spiritual house. We are born again believers who have accepted Jesus Christ. And what I mean by accept him, we've given up our way of living for his way of living. Uh, as Apostle Paul said, for I am crucified, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I believe this is Galatians uh, 2, and, 2 and 20. Uh, and so we are a spiritual house now. It goes on to say for a holy, meaning a dedicated and consecrated priesthood. Wait a minute. Eli and his sons were priests, okay? And with Israel, they was using a high priest and then other priests who had to be Levites. Before Jesus died on the cross, you had to be a Levite to hold these positions. And they served in the temple or the, tab the tabernacle. In the temple, we understand that there was the holy place where the priest would come in and do certain things. But then behind another curtain was the most holy or the holy of holies, where only the high priest and only once a year could enter this room. And he had to have done everything right to satisfy God's demands so that God will accept the offering. Otherwise, he would fall dead and they had to pull him out by a rope that was attached around him because so, he died. Now, this house is different. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus runs the house. Jesus is the top. He's the preeminence. He has the authority. And he says here, for a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood. What priesthood? Who are these priests that he's referring to? To offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, that is us. That is us. We are the priests now. We are priests. We are servants of God representing God to the world. Every believer is a priest. We don't have to go to a man and offer doves and go and say so many Hail Marys and all the rest of that. No, every believer has the right because of what Jesus Christ did and given his ultimate sacrifice, his life and offering his blood for us. Every believer has the right to come into the presence of God. Yet today we have people who are faithful church members. We have people who may have won the member of the month who serve uh, in different capacities in a house, maybe at a certain address or, or, or a certain temple or tabernacle. And, and, and they look at that house as being the house of God. They look at that, that nonprofit organization as being the house of God. And they look at the leader or the leaders over that nonprofit organization as being the priest. But I came to correct an error because some are not teaching it accurately. Yes, there are pastors and there are teachers and evangelists and prophets, but they are not the high priest and you just, you know, just lay members. In fact, the word lay, you won't even see it in scripture. That's a term that we put to it, clergy and lay member. 
That's not God's way of talking. That kind of came about after Constantine and some of the others that wanted to be, quote unquote, I guess, labeled as Christians and they merge, you know, government with the church. But if we look at how God called, called it, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And Jesus is saying, I want my house back. What house? My spiritual house. Now you say, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? We, we worship God. We serve him. We, we give our tithes and our offerings and we, we, we have programs and all the rest of that. Beloved, you can be faithful in, 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 in a church. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, I'm not saying anything is wrong with the gathering of the saints together and, and us coming together and benefiting from the gifts and the anointings that God has placed on certain one's lives and fellowshipping. But in my years of serving, and you're talking about 30 years here, I've watched people be faithful to an organization. I watched them even be faithful to men in an organization. And I do believe that if the leader is telling you the right thing to do, the scriptures say obey them that have the rule over you. Uh, if he's telling you the right thing to do, then and God is saying it, then you are obligated to uh, follow what God is saying. However, obey them that have the rule over you. If you study out that word obey, okay, in that there's an element of being persuaded. It, it, it deals with evidence. It's like being on the court or the jurors. And the judge may direct them to say that you must look at the evidence. And whatever the evidence says, if the evidence proves this, then you go with it. So me as a spiritual leader, I know when I give any directive from the Holy Spirit to a, a believer, I can't give them a directive because of me. I have to be able to prove in the scriptures that God said you need to do this. Then God is with me, and then that person then if they don't obey it, then they're disobeying God. I can't come up with a rule for myself and then say, because I'm Pastor Baker, you must do this. I can't go around saying, I feel led. I feel led that we need to do this. And, and that's happening in the body. People are so committed to their organization and the leader that many times they don't know if God is involved or not. That should not be the case. That's why we have the canon, the rule of the scripture. So that we can compare it to what God has said. Beloved, if God didn't say it, uh, then you don't have to do it. Beloved, if God said it, then yes, you do have to do it. Because God has put those, not priests, as being more important to you. But he's given to certain priests or certain brothers an anointing to help the body of Christ. I say it again. An anointing to help the body of Christ. Not to rule the body of Christ. All right, so let's get back to this, and we, we'll get into this, I'm sure, in, in other teachings. I get excited. I love the word of God. Jeremiah says, like fire that's shut up in my bone, uh, and I want to speak it. And I know some of the things that I'm going to speak will not be popular, okay? And, and in fact, again, the reason why I'm even here talking to you is because, uh, yes, God has called me, I believe, to do it. But I was hesitant because so many people are wanting to get their names out there and their face out there. Man, I could care less uh, about that. But when people who have heard other messages that the Lord has spoken through me have said, look, please share some of the things God has given you. Uh, I went before God and I'm like, you know what? OK, Lord, it's not about me. I'll come out and I'll speak the truth of God. And so because of them. And I thank them for praying for me. And I thank them for trusting the gift of God in my life. And I want them to trust the gift. I don't want them to trust me. Uh, there's no good thing that dwelleth in our flesh. I love God and I fear God and I submit myself to God. But see, you're not obligated to follow and trust me if I get off of the word of God. This needs to be said in the body of Christ because we have people traveling around the world. We have them going to conferences. They're, they're wearing T-shirts. They got their favorite leader. They got their favorite person this. And they don't even pray. They don't even read the Bible on a regular basis. So when somebody tell them something, I feel led by the spirit or a spirit, they simply follow them. No, we have to be like those, I believe, uh, that was of Berea, uh, who went and searched out these things to see if they were so. When somebody preaches the word to you, you're not obligated just to receive that. Go search it out. And if they are a leader of God, you could come back and say, look, I didn't find that. Could you please show me where it's at? And if they tell you, well, don't worry about that. The anointing is on me. Just follow me. Ah, uh, no, no, not so. Not so. Uh, and I know people use this as a cover and obey them. They have the rule over you. That's as long as you're connected with Christ as an under shepherd 
or a prophet, a teacher, evangelist, and you're connected with Christ, that they didn't go by that rule. But once you disconnect for Christ, you're not abiding in him and you're doing your own thing. The people of God are under no obligation to obey something that go, will go directly against God. Remember these men, these sons of Eli, who were doing their own thing and told the people, no, I'm going to take this now. And if you don't give it to me, I'm going to take it by force. So people get intimidated. They say, you know, I hear today people say, well, touch not God's anointed. I'm God's anointed. Well, come on, we have to be careful with that. If you're using that from the Old Testament, talking about Saul and David and how David wouldn't touch Saul, you know, don't touch God's anointed or whatever the case is. Beloved, that's because back then uh, Jesus Christ hadn't died. If you were filled with the Holy Ghost and you receive Jesus Christ, Christ is the anointed one. That's what the name Christ means. Jesus means God saves. Yes, Jesus means God saves and Christ means the anointed one. Put it together. He's the one God is anointed to save men. Uh, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you are anointed. <laughs> So all of us are anointed. We may have different callings, but all of us are anointed. So don't feel inferior. Now, what I'm saying to you is not for you to go up against anybody who is saying something to you that is of God that you can verify in the scriptures. What I'm trying to say to you is you're not a slave to a man, a system, an organization, a denomination. You are a bond servant, a willing worker of the Lord Jesus Christ. That trumps all. Christ wants the headship back in his church. He wants his house back. All right, we're in 1 Peter 2, and we're looking at verse 5. I'm reading out the Amplified again. To offer up those spiritual sacrifices. What spiritual sacrifice? Beloved, we offer up our bodies. Paul says it over in Romans, I believe, 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What is Paul saying? That you bring your body, present your body, its members, as a living sacrifice to God. Whatever God wants you to do. If God touches your heart and says, give that sister $25, you at the gas station, and she says, you feel it in your spirit, that person needs gas money. And the Holy Spirit is directing you and urging you to do it. And you have the $25 and he's directing you. If you don't give it, then you have disobeyed the spirit. Okay? You didn't offer up your body by putting your hand in your wallet, taking out from your income and giving to that person. All right? See, many times we, we, we will do the thing that a natural man tells us. All right, saints, y'all be here at church at 7 o'clock. It's going to start. You need to be here. All right, this is what time prayer start, start being. Saints are flocking in and running. They fear men. But God is a jealous God. He wants them to fear him. The Bible said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If a man or woman doesn't fear God, they can't be wise. The wisdom they have has to be natural. But if you're going to have spiritual wisdom, the first step, the foundation is to fear God. What does fear mean? To reverence him, to adore him, to deny yourself from him, for him. That's where fear comes in. So that everything that you have belongs to God. Everything. Everything, beloved. Not just because you dropped off 10% in the offering and you gave a tithe. Now, I've done my duty. I've attended church. I've sung in the choirs. I've given God Sunday and Wednesday, Sunday morning, or maybe Sunday night and Wednesday night. But now I'm on my own Monday through Tuesday. And nobody's going to bother me because I'm a good tithe paying member. I'm a good giver. They're not going to bother me. No, 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 no. No. The New Testament don't know anything about that. You are to present your body a living sacrifice every single day of your life. And if God tells you to give 70%, if the Holy Spirit leads you, then that's what you do. We have to start getting under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I say this because I've met so many people. And even when I, as I was pastoring different congregations, people would come to me and talk to me about different things. And I said, God, I'll go to do it. And God said, what are you doing? I said, well, Lord, this is what I was taught to do. He said, listen to me. Now you're in a place of authority that you are the, the, the spiritual leader here. Do not tell my people to do anything that I have not said in this word that they could do. Because Felton, it is not your house. You cannot do what you want to do. All right? So we want to obey God. All right. The Bible says, uh, offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. All right. All right. Now, turn. Well, I say turn over. You may not have to turn over in your Bible. Look at verse number nine. Rather, we are the priests. Who's the priest? The Bible says, but ye are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. There goes, beloved, beloved, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness unto mother's life. People love to show forth the praises of their individual churches. They put on T-shirts and they got tags representing their church. And I'm telling you, now you think it's funny. 
But people represent the natural things, the building, uh, the name of the church, uh, more than they will represent Jesus Christ. <laughs> They'll go to their job, curse out their, their, their different people. Uh, they, they, they'll cheat. They'll steal. But nobody bothers them because they're good tithe paying, good give, uh, offering giving members, and they're faithful to the house of God. Well, what house of God? That brick building? Beloved, that's not the house of God. If they don't pay their rent, a drug dealer can end up renting that building, or some, some, some businessman can end up renting that building and turning it into what he wants. It's not that building that makes it a house of God. God is interested in his people. When we gather, when two or three gather in his name, he'll be in the midst of us. All right? So we are the priesthood. All right? Now, what are we supposed to do? Go to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. And look at verse number Start at verse 8, Ephesians 4, 8. It says, I'm going to read this out of King James. It says, Wherefore he said, when he ascended, talking about Christ, up on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So these gifts come from Jesus Christ. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He went down there and made... Uh, try, uh, obtained triumphant victory over the enemy, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and led those that were bound, bound out. And in his ascension to God, he left some gifts. Verse 11, and he gave some apostles. Everybody's not an apostle. Apostle there is a special messenger. Now you can study John and Peter and Paul, these men that laid the foundation. And after they would leave a place, they would, they would uh, uh, raise up, uh, see elders who were maturing. And then they would put those elders in those congregations as they went to continue uh, establishing foundations and uh, having churches, local churches, if you will, local gatherings, not buildings now, because they didn't have buildings like we have. They weren't going like today. We think of a church. We got to have a building. We got to do this or that. Yes, that's a nice convenience, but that is not what the Bible is talking about when it's talking about a church. The word church means ecclesia. It means to call out those have been called out of darkness into the marvelous light. We change this word church, uh, which means the assembly now of those that are called out to now mean an assembly that's underneath the roof of a building. It's fine to have a building. Thank God for a building. But that's not the interest. The interest is those people who have the spirit of Christ inside of them. He gave some apostles, means special messengers. All right. He commissioned them for a task. And some prophets, uh, those prophets there are inspired speakers. What do I mean by the word inspire? When you talk about inspiring, it's something that's coming from outside of you, upon you. It influences you and allows you to do a particular thing. So a prophet is an inspired. The Holy Spirit moves upon him or her and they speak the word of God. And sometimes people live in fear of prophets, you know, and we use different scriptures, you know, and you get a prophet's reward and all of that. And people live in fear. They don't have a relationship for themselves. And men are dominating them and women are dominating them. And they're giving offerings. If you if you get a certain word from God, I get in this line for seventy dollars, get in this line for seven hundred dollars. Beloved, that's not God's way. That, that, that reminds me of the base and worthless sons of Eli who was taking advantage of the people of God and manipulating them. And that's a form of witchcraft. And I'm not ashamed to say it. We see it happening throughout the church world today. Some leaders won't even come in unless they get a contract uh, saying how much they're going to get paid before they even get there. That's not in the Bible, beloved. Do not be deceived. And don't put a man or woman above God. That gift that they have, that gift is a free gift. Jesus said, freely you have received. You've received from me. Now freely go and give. Freely. Now, there's nothing wrong. You know people got to travel, and so you want to take care of their expenses and, and things like that if you ask them to come in. But we've done this thing wrong. We've not kept it in line with God's word. And if Paul and John and Peter were looking back at us, they would simply say, what is going on with the church? We risked and hazard our life for the gospel. And, and Paul many times worked with his own hand. In some places, he worked so he wouldn't have to uh, have the saints give him anything. So he, they wouldn't say, well, you did it because, for this reason. So it's all right to receive a gift or somebody give you a gift. But I meant we put a demand that I'm not going to show up and speak God's word to God's people, which the gift is freely given to me. It's not mine for God's people. Oh, that's an error. That's an error. That's an error. We got to stick with this word. But God gave some apostles. He gave some prophets, some evangelists 
preachers of the gospel. I mean, they have a special anointing to go speak to non-believers and, and these people who accept Jesus Christ. Some pastors and teachers. The word pastor there means shepherd. It means shepherd, beloved. The word pastor there means shepherd. We have taken this word and we've divided it up in the body of Christ and we created so many different levels. We have archbishops, we have bishops, we have uh, jurisdictional bishops, prelates. Uh, normally go somewhere like this. You know, you have a bishop and then this bishop is over other bishops and then he's over pastors and these pastors are over elders, these elders over ministers. And we have like a rank structure in the body of Christ. Again, go back to the scripture. Go back to the scripture. And I'll get into this later in some other teachings. But the word pastor there means shepherd. And when you look at the word elder, it means senior among you. Not so much talking about age. Senior, so far as experience. It's like the oldest child in the family. That child is not in control of the family. If me and my wife go to the movies and we leave our oldest son in charge, the reason why we leave him in charge is because he's older. He's familiar with us. He's more responsible. His job then is to make sure that what we leave for the younger children is taken care of. Once we leave to go to the movies, he don't get the chance now to come in and make the younger child clean his shoes. Uh, if it's his night to wash dishes, make the younger child wash dishes for him. Uh, no, no, it's not his house. It's still me and my wife's house. It's still God's house. You're just older, meaning you're more responsible. You don't dominate it. And I hear people today talking about my people and my church and my people. Uh, uh, beloved fellow uh, spiritual leaders, come on now. You're a sheep as well. You've just been given an anointing by Jesus Christ to help the body. Not for your advantage. Oh, I know we're not going to be able to get through all this. Uh, right now we're at 46 minutes. And I love teaching. I love God's word. But we're not going to get through it here. We'll have to look forward to uh, another time to get into it. But he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Uh, the word bishop. The word bishop means to superintend, to oversee. It's the idea of the shepherd going up to a sheep. And going through the wool, looking to see if there are any parasites or anything sucking out life from the sheep. Or if they're damaged in any way. That word bishop means to oversee with the desire to help. Not oversee with the desire for you to sin. Because uh, I get so many churches under me and all y'all tithe to me. And therefore you send me your tithe from your church so that I am your father. And you are my sons. And as my sons, I'm the bishop. And you do what I tell you to do. Uh, otherwise, you won't have credentials in this particular organization. Uh, some people are bishoping, uh, for the lack of a better word, making it a verb instead of a noun, for the idea to make sure that they get a Rolls Royce, for the idea to make sure that they get enough money, for the idea to become famous, the idea to network and connect with other bishops and, and become somebody. Beloved, that's not what this was about. I'm going to show you what it was about. The Bible says... Uh, why then, uh, it says, Pastor T, look at verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. This is why Jesus Christ gave these anointings. For the perfecting of the saints. God gave Eli and his sons, they had this office to help the people of Israel. Not to manipulate them. Not to take more than what was there. But to get them to a point where they understood God. Understood God's commands. And they explained God in a way where they will fall in love with God. Okay, and be strong in God. But they were base and worthless. And God dealt with them. And I'm telling you, God's getting ready to deal with the body of Christ. He set back, not that he wasn't concerned, because he sent many warnings, and said to the church, okay, correct this, correct this, correct that. But there comes a time where God rises up and says, no, I'm going to free my people. There was a message I preached years ago as I, I get ready to close here, because, you know, it's just so much to get into. But the Lord said to me, and I was pastoring, it was the first time I was pastoring, uh, in a city not far from here. And the Lord said to me, you know, to preach this message, and he called it this. He said, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. I was like, excuse me, God? Pharaoh? What do you mean Pharaoh? That, that, that was for people that was controlling, the, controlling your people who was of a foreign nation that had them in bondage. And he said, well, Pharaoh is men who have risen to a top status. And they have kingdoms that they want to build. And they're going to use my people, their resources, their talents and their abilities. Control them to the point that they build cities for Pharaoh or build whatever it is, whatever plan. And what has happened is the enemy has deceived. Many have come into the church with an agenda. Not everybody, but many have come into the church with an agenda. To be, make themselves somebody. To be entrepreneurs, if you will. 
more business minded. We're going to have this on the south side and this on the north side. And when I'm finished, we're going to have a, a, a building over here where we're going to uh, uh, take care of the senior citizens. And, and many times they get in competition looking at what, what some other pastor has done. And, and they get the people and they say, look, I have a vision. Here's my vision. My vision is this. And if the people buy into the vision and they give all their resources in it. And many times I've seen where the leader just get up and leave and leave the people with the debt. Leave them with the unfinished thing. This is wrong, beloved, because it's not in building a building that we are successful. It's in building the people. Leaders should be the thing. Even when we ask each other, well, how's the church going? When we say to another leader, well, how's the church going? What we should be saying is, well, the saints are studying the word. The saints are learning the word. The saints are loving God. They, they're not perfect, but they are perfecting. They're, they're, they're in that verb form moving toward Jesus Christ. But you know what a lot of times I find with leaders when they ask you, well, how's the church going? What kind of budget you got? You know, the amount of money you have uh, uh, available on hand or whatever. Uh, you're looking at building a new edifice. Uh, uh, do you have a great sound system in the church? Uh, do you, do you, you know, they look at the material things. This is not God's will. When he gave the pastor, the teacher, the prophet, and, and, uh, and, and all of these to the body of Christ, the Bible is specific. And I got to say this before we go, because if I don't, it'll be just something hanging there. And I think I could do that in about two minutes. Listen to this. Why did he give these gifts? For the perfecting of the saints. The word perfecting means to complete, repair, furnish, to build the saints up. Get them ready. Get them strong. It's like resetting a bone. Or it's like when you're mending a net and there's a break in the net. You go and you retie it. Make it strong. That's what God gave these gifts to us. To perfect the saints. Why? For the work of the ministry. They're supposed to be doing the work of the ministry. They should be going to the hospital praying for the sick. They should be doing a lot of things that pastors have put on themselves. Uh, and now they're burnt out. And that's why a lot of them demand a big offering. Because the saints are not going to do anything. I got to do all the work. Well, pay me big time for it. Well, if you did it the way the Bible said, you won't have to worry about all that stress. Because you will raise up people and, 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 and be able through the Spirit to look at the gifts that they have and, and, and kind of let the Spirit of God lead you as, you as you encourage them to use the gifts that they have. And you will only have to do the work of, of, of preparing the saints. But when you're trying to do everything uh, and, and you're doing it all, then, then burnout sets in and, and other things. He said, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And this edifying doesn't deal with a natural building. It's talking about the building up of the body of Christ. The saints of God are maturing. The disciples are growing in number. Yes, that's good. But also growing in quality and in maturity. Watch this. How long should we do this preparing and, 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 and do the work of pre preparing them? Till we come into the unity of the faith. Unity of the faith. United in the faith. All right. Of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's our aim. That's my aim as a pastor teacher. Not that you know my name and not that you honor me to the point. Yes, we should be honored. The Bible says to honor them, you know, that the elders that, that serve and that teach, honor. But honor can be, oh, it could be, I mean, I don't know, maybe you make a nice sweet potato pie. And you say, you know what, I want to do this for, for pastor. I want to do this for the prophet. And so you give that. But today we take an honor to another level. Uh, you come down to pastor's anniversaries and stuff like that. We're demanding from the people a certain amount. You got to bring $250. Some pastoral committee go out and tax. I know we don't want to hear it that way, but that's what it is. They go and assess the people, tax the people. How dare we? Where in scripture did God give us the ability to tax God people and say, if you love your pastor, you got to give $250 in this anniversary. No, 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 no. That, the Bible doesn't know anything about that. No, that's man-made. We did that to support the building and to keep the budget up. Uh, no, when you give to somebody, you give because you love them. If you give, and I can show you in the scripture and I won't do it tonight. The Bible says that we should give. As the Holy Spirit leads us. We shouldn't give out of compulsion or necessity. Excuse me. Compulsion means somebody wearing you down. All right, saints, if you want a new house, you better give. All right, saints, if you want a word from God. And they've beaten you down. Wearing you down. You couldn't give a thousand, so now they move it to 500. You don't have 500, they move it to 250. By the end of the night, we done took up a whole hour raising an offering till they finally get you in the $2.50 line. Now, what is this? Is this an auction? I'm telling you, God is not pleased with this. God is not pleased with it. 
We have to be led by the Spirit. And we're supposed to provoke one another to love and good works. And at the end, verse 14, here is what the end of all this is about. So far as preparing God's house. God said, I want my house back. He's giving it to these, the, to these elders and stuff just to watch over it. It's not their house. It's God's house. They're just like big brothers watching over those that are younger. He said, that ye be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slay of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. As I end, I'm going to say to you that God was upset with Eli and he was upset with how those priests were running the house. As a reminder, we're in the New Testament. All of us are priests. The head priest is Jesus Christ. I may be a pastor given the anointing and the gift by Jesus Christ to prepare the body as God will allow me to come in contact with others. Those of you that are listening here today, my sole desire is to prepare you, teach you through this word. Elders are here to correct error. When error comes into the church, the church is doing something against the scripture. That's why elders are there. The mature ones, because they know how Jesus wants the house to be ran. He's going away. He's sitting at the right hand of his father, but he's coming back again. And we're going to have to give an account for the gifts he gave us, the talents he gave us. And when he come back and hear that we've taken over the house, he's not going to be happy. He wants to hear that we have done what was right concerning the word of God in preparing his people. Now, beloved, those of you out there, some of you, <laughs> how can I say this? You got to be careful because even as believers, sometimes we know the games that get ran on us and we play the games because we're looking for a position ourselves. We're looking to rise up through the ranks and become maybe a pastor, a prophet. So we could get some gain too. Oh, the spell. Get away from that idea. Uh, this should not be about profit. The church should never be a profit, a money making business. Now, I know you need money to pay rent for a building and things of those natures, na that nature. But but it, it should be there to just for simple things that we need. The most important thing is to build God's people up to be more like Jesus Christ. That's what he's going to say. Beloved, well done, that good and faithful servant. So again, tonight we just compared the house, house of uh, God in that day to the house of God today. You all are priests. Every one of you are priests. Love God. Fall in love with Jesus. Father, I pray this now. I pray this for those that are listening. And we'll listen to this uh, video. I pray, God, that you will begin to allow them to see you in a way. I urge their hearts to go after you like they've never gone after you before. They'd be fall so deeply in love with you, God, that Sunday and Wednesday, uh, uh, there are services where they could come together and be with other believers. But I tell you what, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and Saturday, the time that they're spending with you alone becomes just as precious because they know you and they know your voice. Let us not be a generation that don't know God and end up going into different forms of bondage because we are ignorant of the scriptures. God, your people should not be ignorant. They're not going to be ignorant. As long as I can have breath in my body and you allow this gift to remain on my life, I will speak to the body of Christ and encourage them and provoke them to love and good works. And that day God will study the word to show themselves approved. Oh God, that they will give you the top place in their life, not a man or a woman. Yes, we are to respect those and honor those that have the gifts that you put in their lives, but within boundary, not above you. You are the ultimate. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name.